Right. Uh, I made a clippy joke a minute ago, but if you weren't uh, alive in the 90s, it probably didn't land for you. Um, but it's good to see everybody. We're going through the book of uh, Mark. Uh, we're in Mark chapter 12 today. Are we at the beginning? Oh, no. How do we get, how do we get there? Hang on. Oh, that's not verse 12. That's the beginning of chapter 12. Okay. So uh, we uh, last week had our uh, uh, teaching Sunday. We were in Mark chapter 11, and we saw Jesus making some um, pretty bold statements. Um, the, the religious elite, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they came. They tried to, to trip him up. They weren't able to trip him up, and uh, they vowed, in some translations it says they vowed to destroy him, to destroy Jesus, um, or uh, to assassinate him, as in, in other translations. Uh, but they basically have started this plot that they, they have decided they're going to kill Jesus because he's too much of a threat to uh, their power structure. And so it's very interesting to me that we see that in 11, and then Jesus publicly tells this story right at the beginning of Mark chapter 12. Jesus began teaching that this is called the parable of the tenants, like a, like a tenant like that would rent a place out, right? The parable of the tenants. Then Jesus began teaching them with stories. A man planted a vineyard and he built a wall around it. He dug a pit for pressing out the grape juice and he built a lookout tower. Then he leased the vineyard to tenant farmers and moved to another country. So he takes this land he makes this land fit for purpose. He, he gives this land uh, value beyond just kind of the, the land itself. He sets the structure up and he rents it to these tenant farmers. And at the time of the grape harvest, he sends one of his servants to collect his share of the crop. But the farmers grabbed the servant, beat him, and sent him back empty-handed. Okay, now this story is a not so thinly veiled story about the people of Israel and specifically the religious leadership, right? That God has left them in charge, his chosen people, right? These tenant farmers, that God has left them in charge. And when he, he sends his messengers and his servants to basically remind them uh, of who he is, and what he is owed as a part of this arrangement, they uh, they grab the servant, they beat him up, and they send him back empty-handed. And this, uh, we're going to see this happen a couple of times in this story. And as we're going through it, uh, the the implication here is these are like the prophets that have come before, the prophets that that God has sent to to speak His word, to remind the people uh, of their allegiances, and the people um, would oftentimes reject these prophets, reject the advice of these prophets. The owner then sent another servant, but they insulted him and beat him over the head. The next servant he sent was killed. Others he sent were either beaten or killed until there was only one left. His son, whom he loved dearly. So Jesus, in this story, this is self-referential. Jesus is referring now to himself as the one and only begotten son of God, right? The owner finally sent him, thinking, surely they will respect my son. But the tenant farmers said to one another, here comes the heir to the estate. Let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves, right? Jesus is telling the story in the presence of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's letting them know that he knows what their plan is, right? And he's also telling the story because he wants his disciples to understand that this is him as well. Uh, he's reminded his disciples again and again that soon he will be dying, but he will be returning. And the disciples kind of act like they don't, they don't seem to get it quite yet, right? Uh, and so this is yet another reminder to the disciples of this. So they grabbed him and murdered him and threw his body out of the vineyard, right? So Jesus is saying this is what happens even to the son of, uh, of the, the owner of this vineyard. So what do you suppose the owner of the vineyard will do, Jesus asked? I'll tell you, he will come and kill those farmers and lease the vineyard to others. Whoa. Well, I mean, in the context of the story, this sounds kind of justified, right? But what does this mean? Je right? Jesus, again, is specifically talking about the leadership, right? 
the the leadership his his chosen people and the religious leadership they were kind of left to care for the vineyard and they continued to reject the owner of the vineyard right we see jesus again and again talking to the pharisees and the sadducees and everybody he says look you know the law well but you're kind of missing the whole point of it right and so so there's something very interesting here that Jesus says that actually mirrors something that is to come. When Jesus says he will come and kill those farmers, he will remove that leadership, right? And then he says this, and he will lease the vineyard to others. And that's really interesting because what Jesus is saying here is that you are my chosen people, but now this vineyard is going to be leased to others, the, released to others, the the, the leadership for my people is going to be released to others. And Jesus is signaling here um, the coming and the opening up of his word and his message to the Gentiles. So those who were not, uh, who were not of uh, Israel, right? Who, who were not of, the, of Jewish descent and Jewish lineage. So Jesus is saying here, this is going to be open to everybody. You have, you have abused your, your, your position here and you will be removed. Your time... Uh, as leaders is at an end because you have not been faithful with what you have been given. And now that will be leased to others. Didn't you ever read this in the scriptures? And here he quotes from the Old Testament. The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it is wonderful to see, right? So the stone that the builders rejected is going to become, is Jesus, right? He's, he's saying, you're, you're, you have rejected me. You're going to reject me. But in doing so, I will be the cornerstone of this new paradigm that is going to be built. The religious leaders wanted to arrest Jesus because they realized he was telling the story against them. Again, not a super thinly veiled uh, story, especially since we saw just in Mark 11 that they had vowed to assassinate, uh, to destroy him, right? To kill him. Uh, But uh, they were the wicked farmers, but they were afraid of the crowd. So we see this uh, again. This is also in Mark 11. They're afraid of the crowd. They're afraid of the people. Jesus has really won the people over. And so they have to come up with a plan. Uh, they, their plan is, well, right now, the people love him. The people adore him, and we can't move against him because of how much the people love him. So they decide that what they're going to do is they're going to trip him up. And they are going to go to him, and they're going to get him to say something. They're going to try to trick him. Uh, My understanding is we've even seen that in this space recently, right? That some folks have come in and recording and have tried to to get uh, some folks here to say something that would be offensive to turn the people uh, against us, right? Uh, And so that's kind of what they're trying to do with Jesus. They're trying to turn the people against Jesus here. So let's see what their plan is going to be as we move forward. Later, the leaders sent some Pharisees uh, and supporters of Herod, it says Herodites in some translations, uh, to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. Okay, now this is sort of an interesting, uh, (laughs) this is an interesting team up, right? Uh, Think like, uh, (laughs) I don't know, I hesitate to use this analogy since uh, they're technically both good guys in the end, right? But like, this is, uh, okay, this is like Iron Man and, and... Thanos is not a good guy. I understand that. I'm changing what my analogy was going to be. This would be like Iron Man and Thanos teaming up. Okay? (laughs) Right? The Herodites and the Pharisees, they did not get along well uh, uh, at all. But they decided that for them and for the power that they enjoyed, the Herodites, the supporters of Herod, we we can think of them as like political leaders. Okay? So you've got the Pharisees who are like the spiritual leaders. And the Herodites, these supporters of Herod, and they're like the political leaders. And they decide to team up because they decide, both of them decide, that this Jesus guy's popularity is a threat to them and their power. So it became one of those, well, my enemy of, and my enemy is my friend, right? So they join forces against Jesus, and they're going to try to trick him into saying something he could be arrested for. Uh, they're going to try to get him to, to speak out against Rome or something like that. And if they can get him to do that, then he can be arrested and uh, they can kind of have the situation handled, right? So here's what they do. Teacher, they say, we know how honest you are. You're important and you don't 
play favorites, you teach the way of God truthfully. Mm, flattery, right? Like, <laughs> you could just, this is just dripping with this, like, sarcastic flattery, right? As they're trying to, to bait Jesus into saying something. Now tell us, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or shouldn't we? Hmm. I want to know what Jesus is going to say about whether or not they should pay taxes. Because they know if they say that they should pay taxes to Caesar. So here's why this is a question. This is, they're trying to trap Jesus, right? Because if Jesus says they should pay taxes to Caesar, then he's going to lose the support of the people who hate Caesar and his taxation. And the tax collectors were known to be thieves. And there's this whole historical reason for that, right? But if he says yes, you should pay taxes, then what he's going then what he's going to do is he's going to lose the support of the people. But if he says no, you shouldn't pay taxes, then he's going to anger the Roman government uh, because of his popularity and they're going to consider him basically an anarchist and they're going to have him arrested right then and there and drug off to jail. So that's the trap that they've laid here, okay? Let's see. How does Jesus respond in the face of this trap? Jesus saw through their hypocrisy, and he says, why are you trying to trap me? Show me a Roman coin, and I will tell you. So Jesus says, go get, go get a coin. You pay taxes with these coins. Go get these coins, and I'll tell you what you should do. So when they handed the coin to him, he says, whose picture and title are stamped on this coin? And they say, Caesar's. Well, then, Jesus said, it's got his name on it. It's got his picture on it, right? Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and give to God what belongs to God. See how he really avoided that question entirely, right? Is it right to pay taxes? He's like, well, it's right to give Caesar back what belongs to Caesar, and this has his picture on it. So give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what belongs to God. And his reply completely amazed them, right? They weren't ready for that. They weren't ready for Jesus to completely sidestep, but still answer that question in such a powerful way. And then Jesus was approached by some Sadducees. They are also religious leaders like the Pharisees, uh, but they don't believe in uh, resurrection from the dead. Like, you die, you die. Like, that's it. I um, hope you had a good life. Uh, that's really what matters, you know. And uh, they pose this question to him. They say, Teacher Moses gave us a law that if a man dies, uh, leaving a wife without children, uh, his brother should marry the widow and have a child who will carry on his brother's name. Okay, so this is a law uh, um, in the Old Testament, and it was set up really to protect widows, right? So if there is a, a woman and her husband dies, uh, at that point, she culturally would have been ostracized, would have had no one to provide for her uh, and so this law was instituted so that there would be some sort of succession uh, where there would be someone, hopefully, who could uh, take care of her. And then also, if this happened and the, the, the brother uh, married the widow, then that widow's first son legally would be considered the son of the original deceased uh, individual and would would have all of the the rights of uh, lineage and all of those sorts of things that, that come with that the inheritance all of those sorts of things so anyway that's the the backstory for this law and so they come up with this really completely ridiculous contrived scenario to see what Jesus will say about this it's another one of those like well let's kind of trick him let's back him into a corner let's get him to answer this thing and see how many people that we can make angry at his answer to the question uh, so that we can turn the people against him. Well, suppose there's seven brothers and the oldest one married and dies without children. So the second brother married the widow, but then he died without children. Then the third brother married her. This continues with all seven and there's still no children. And then the woman also dies. So tell us in the resurrection, direction whose wife will she be since all seven were married to her right so they're trying to trick jesus up because jesus has kind of spoken about this resurrection and they're trying to trip him up uh by, con by having this totally crazy contrived scenario in which okay all these things happen so in the resurrection who who whose wife is she right and so jesus replied your mistake is that you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of god for when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. 
in this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. So basically what he's saying here is like marriage is this thing that is here on earth, right? Um, and theologically, right, marriage sort of represents um, our relationship with each other and coming together and becoming one represents that relationship that we have with, with God, right? Uh, and so he's saying, like, there's no need for that analogy anymore, right, at the resurrection, because we don't need that symbolism anymore because you will have seen me and my father, right? So he's saying that's not even the point anymore at that, at that point. Your mistakes, you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. For when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. But then he goes one step further to kind of uh, help correct them. But now as to whether the dead will be raised, because he knows that the whole reason they're trying to trap him is because they don't believe in this resurrection. He said, haven't you read about this in the writings of Moses, which the Sadducees do did read, do believe, right? In the story of the burning bush, long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, God said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He didn't say, right, this is Jesus' point, he didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, I was the God of Isaac, I was the God of Jacob, right? That's the point that Jesus is making here. So he says, so he is the God of the living, not the dead. You have made a serious error. So what Jesus is saying is that even though they are not physically with us anymore, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they had died, their earthly bodies had died. But this, what God says to Moses here is he's actually saying that, that uh, sorry, I heard this weird sound. What he's saying is that they're actually alive, that God's words here are implying that they are alive because it's not that he was their God, he is their God. Uh, and so that's Jesus confirming for them that they've made an error by not believing in the resurrection. And so we're going to see things are getting, if you've not noticed yet, if you've been with us for a while as we're going through Mark, things are getting spicier and spicier. Uh, this is the way I like to think of it, right? These conflicts between Jesus and the Pharisees are escalating. They've all, they're already in the middle of plotting to kill him, but every plot that they put up against him uh, continues to fail. And so what then needs to be their plan? Well, we're going to find out soon that their plan was to get a man on the inside to betray Jesus, right? And we're going to see that coming uh, soon in the next couple of chapters. Uh, but for now, that's reached the end of what we're going to cover here today in Mark chapter 12. I encourage you to, to catch up with us and, uh, and read through the book of Mark. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. I actually had, uh, I don't think I've really talked about this before, but several years ago, I was kind of struggling with this crisis in my faith and trying to understand and reconcile who I thought Jesus was versus who people were telling me that Jesus was, if that makes sense. Like the things that I needed to believe and the th things that I should believe and, uh, you know, because of this verse and that verse. And I was really kind of struggling. And I felt that, that God just called me to try to forget everything that I had ever been taught about who Jesus was. And instead to start reading through the Gospels with no preconceived notions or ideas. I'm just going to put myself there and I'm going to observe, uh, you know, through the eyes and ears of the, the people that are uh, telling the story, who Jesus is and who Jesus was. And when I did that, I really had a, um, it was a really transformational, a really pivotal moment for me and my faith. And that was the moment for me that I think I came away with my faith. It wasn't the faith in my pastor's. It wasn't the faith of my friends. It wasn't the faith of my family or my parents. I read for myself, and I saw who Jesus is and what he did and the instructions that he gave. And it was this really transformative experience. And so I encourage all of you to, to try that. Um, just forget everything that you have been told about who Jesus is, what he believes, what he would do in these different situations. And just go back to scripture and observe and just watch and listen as you read through scripture and who Jesus is talking to and what he says. 
Uh, and I think that you'll find, like it was for me, that to be a pretty um, transformational and sort of a liberating experience to come away with that with your own faith and understanding of who Jesus is instead of just what you have always been told. So uh, as we're going through Mark, I strongly encourage you to go back from the beginning of the book of Mark. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospels. They all kind of tell the same story with a little bit of a different perspective. And then John also tells the same story, but from a pretty dramatically different perspective. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke are uh, the synoptic gospels. So they share a lot of overlap there. And I encourage you all to, to, to check that out. So... All right, with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and close us out in prayer. God, we thank you so much for this time to be together here in the metaverse in your name, God, and to study your word and to study your scriptures. And um, God, I just want to, I, I want to thank you for especially this last verse uh, where Jesus calls out the Sadducees and he says, you have made a serious error in denying the resurrection, God, because we thank you for that resurrection. We thank you that that this is not the end for us, God, that there is something past this time just on this earth, uh, God. And I and I just I thank you for that opportunity and I thank you for for sending your son, God, and helping kind of pave this way uh for us into that thing that is after that we can spend eternity with you. God, I thank you for everything that you have done in and through this group here at VR and MMO Church and everything you're going to continue to do in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.